Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Jams and D Podcast's Record Club, where each week one of the members of this podcast picks a record for everybody else to listen to. And this week, uh, the, the 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 phantom known as Morgan D. Atley is uh, he, he's he's vacated this mortal coil uh, and unfortunately cannot be here right now for his record, which right. is is a real boy by say anything that said he does have a bit written for us detailing both the record and his thoughts on the record and why he wanted us to look at it uh, and as well as why uh connor is joining us for talking about this album mm, so indeed the reason morgan picked this record club for us to discuss uh, and of course he would be here if he could be it's just the way these things shake out is essentially this record's an emo classic, and we have talked about a number of emo classics on this podcast before. I mean, one of Morgan's most foundational record club picks was Jimmy Eat World's Clarity, which it feels like, it feels like that was eons ago. But every so That's often- It's shocking we, that that wasn't your pick, honestly. I know. And every so often we get to, we have the opportunity again to talk about an emo classic. And I am- uh, an emo boy at heart like I have a, a very strong affinity for that broad umbrella of music and it feels like we are pretty good as a podcast covering like special records from different eras of sort of modern and, and sort of classical emo um classical emo is such a weird phrase I don't know why I, I picked it to use um but this particular record Mozart it, with a fringe <laughs> <laughs> this, particular, <laughs> this particular record, uh, as Morgan has pointed out, despite being like, if you talk to any kind of like emo scholar or anyone who kind of like writes about or is a big fan of emo, will likely tell you this is a kind of classic staple record. It's kind of been a bit weirdly memory hold, and it's kind of fallen out of fashion even, fallen out of favor. Um, from what I can gather, just kind of digging into the general reception of this record, as well as the fact that I, before I met Connor, I, I never heard anyone talk about this album at all. It's kind of a record that has sort of been a bit forgotten. And, and maybe that's due to the fact that Say Anything have had a pretty underwhelming career in the time since. And they've never really kind of like built on the success and, and beloved reception of this record. And also the fact that this album came out in 2003, 2004, around that time, early to mid 2000s, which was a time where emo in general, in terms of like music press, was not fashionable. In fact, a lot of the emo that came out around that time was getting pretty strongly clowned on. Like music media and music press, um, particularly like alternative music press, were not kind to emo in the early 2000s. And so it's been a case of a lot of these records eventually kind of getting rediscovered and reevaluated. And as Morgan has pointed out, like it's it, it's as much a time for that to happen with this album as it is to happen with any number of emo staples from that era. And so let's talk about Say Anything. Let's talk about As a Real Boy. And let's talk about why potentially this album might be less kind of favorable or less kind of fashionable now like what is it about this record that might make it potentially divisive and spoiler alert we're not all on the same page about it which i think is good which i think will allow us to talk about why potentially this might not be for everyone connor i think it's most fair to turn to you next because it's no secret that this is a canonical connor core album uh you have awarded it the rare honor of five full stars it is a very personal record to you clearly and I want to hear why it means so much to you and what your relationship is with this record how long it's been in your life and what your kind of general feelings are before we start to go kind of more into depth with the songs on this thing for me personally I kind of found this around the time and I'll just uh say what I say every time when I'm here is that I found this on good old Spudnik music uh <laughs> Gotta gotta shout that out. But I noticed like, you know, if you look at like rate your music, it's you know, 3.55, it's pretty good. Uh Spudnik is of like a 4.2 or something, which is very high oh. for an album in this uh particular style. So I was like, so I like put this on and I listened to it. I was like, what the fuck am I listening to? I was like, <laughs> I I don't know what's happening. I don't know what the point is, I don't know what's going on. In case the viewers don't know, the front man is Max Bemis. 
<laughs> it's worth foregrounding Max Bemis as a figure because this is essentially mm-hmm. unfilmed to Max Bemis. Like it is an album that is kind of like it's about a lot of things and it touches on a lot of different subjects, but it's incredibly meta. Like on a on a fundamental yeah. level, whether it's Max talking about himself as a songwriter, Max talking about the scene that he exists within and his relationship mm-hmm. to it. Like this is an album that is through and through, like very meta, very kind of like postmodern and very sort of self-aware and snarky. You can see already where some of those aspects of it might not gel with everyone, but it makes it really interesting as an artifact because not a lot of records in the style are as kind of unabashedly and unashamedly like just kind of provocative as this is in those ways. And I'm sure you can speak a bit more to that, Connor, too. So a lot of the background of this album, I think, helps explain why Max Bemis and company like made this and why they write the way they write. For one, the massive pressure that Bemis put on himself and the band to expand the boundaries of their songwriting and arrangements here clearly shows with every part and structure of each song very meticulously crafted as are the, are the lyrics. It's also worth noting that Is A Real Boy was originally intended to be a full-on musical, which explains that why the band... That makes so <laughs> much sense. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that is crucial to understanding how the songwriting here is. And it also explains why the band would work with uh, the co-producer Stephen Trask, who is actually the creator of the musical called Hedwig, which is worth noting because it's also about a struggling rock star. Intentionally, originally, this was supposed to be about Max himself in kind of, like Riley said, this kind of meta, like this characterization of himself, he, like he's playing the part of himself on this record. And it, it's explained as he's an introverted front man crippled by anxiety and depression who is given a curse that causes him to blurt out all his innermost feelings, anxieties, fantasies, and rants but eventually realizing he is just a flawed human, just like all those he criticizes. This was originally intended to uh, have spoken word interludes as this full blown out story, but he abandoned this idea after this immense self-created pressure got to his mental health, which uh, apparently caused a breakdown in which he supposedly believed he was being filmed for a mockumentary while making this Uh, i read read about this like he fully like had this like it's very kaufman-esque the story of like how this record was made and like the the mad sort of like uh again not that uh bemis is painting himself in this way necessarily but like the mad genius who is like absolutely destroyed by his own like attempts to translate his ideas to the page and live up to these expectations and to make this bombastic like you know uh opus essentially like what i love about this record is that max is essentially throwing everything into this album he, you get the sense that every single fiber of his creative energy and talent and every idea he's ever had is going into this thing but yet you also get this refinement within it where clearly some of that fat has been trimmed and i think the the, the the nice mixture of like these refined and really really potent ideas and this sort of high concept dressing make for a record that it's really kind of attention grabbing and I think like unique within its genre as well it's I didn't know about Stephen Trask but it, I mean hearing that the guy who composed the music of Hedwig and the Angry Itch like had a significant role in the production of this album like retrospectively makes so much sense because those two things have a very similar energy even if the creative forces at the center are quite different it makes it even kind of all the more mystifying and kind of like shameful that this record has seemingly been buried so much because it offers so much and it has what I would think to be so much juice and meat and relevance in terms of like, you know, a, a sort of style of theatrical music that has fallen far out of favor in terms of like, you know, alt indie music and that sort of thing. And, and yeah, I, I don't know, like, that's really fascinating. Like, I think this whole background of like working with the, like intended to be a musical working with Stephen Trask, like really better explains why 
Bemis writes the way he does because he clearly uses that concept that he originally had. It has like an, I think, an easy outlet to express like his all his personal feelings in the most obnoxious, sardonic, humorous, and ridiculous way possible. I would almost regard it as the least subtle emo album maybe ever made just in the way that he writes and the way that he ex- he even performs on this record it also gives the band like permission to extend their own creativity to like soaring heights across many of their peers because these instrumentals on each of these songs kind of do actually give off a musical theater feel and structure they constantly like t- change in tempo style and arrangement to the point where it nearly makes every song here unpredictable but still thoroughly engaging while using the still using the instrumental and production style of the pop punk style to make each song catchy biting and really really memorable what makes this album divisive for some people is um, his heavy use of sarcasm and cynicism in the way he writes and the way he delivers everything but I think he clearly shows that it's kind of a coping me- mechanism for his crippling self-hatred and all his insecurities. It's off-putting, but personally, I find it quite addictive to listen to. Well, yeah. What I think this step? is as good a point as any, Jake, for you to come in. Because I'm curious like, what your experience has been with checking out this record and, and the experience of yeah. listening to it and what you think about the things that we've said so far and how they kind of relate to your experience with the album. Well, it is a safe bet to say that of the albums we were talking about th- uh, this week, this is the one I look- looked forward to talking about the least. I, I will say, uh, as sad as it is, is that we can't be joined by the person who started this record club, is that uh, it's a good thing for me because it means I'm going to encounter at least a, a moderately less amount of bullying uh, for the opinion that I will uh, espouse uh, moderately. I'm, sh- I'm sure that there is certainly uh, that the, maybe we can bring and wake up uh, Connor's inner beast or something. That said, <laughs> saying that it was originally going to be like this, this musical definitely allows me a better in here because the like the overarching thing about this record uh that like i i was thinking this when i listened to it last night and i thought of how i would put this on the podcast and i instantly knew that morgan would tell me to shut the fuck up as soon as i said it but your background on it has granted a little bit of validity in that this album has a a bit of an overbearing theater school kid energy i mean unquestionably and that's I, that's true i though. would agree with that and i like the album and was yeah. that a sigh of relief when we said that it was actually intended to be a musical i like, oh, thank trust god. me you you said that and i was like oh thank god and you know that that's that's like not even that's a neutral descriptor i think that's that's sort of a like you know uh, you you could also, I mean, you could say the same thing about a famous pop punk album from around the same time that was turned into a musical. You could say the same thing about American Idiot. I've had this album on my mind a lot. And my overarching thesis for my feelings on it are, this is a good album that I do not enjoy very much. Uh, and the way I can best illustrate that is the fact that I definitely have had the music of pop punk in my life for so much less time than anyone else on this podcast has uh just because i got into music far later and i feel like i just kind of missed the boat for the right age to sort of discover that like i didn't get into that genre until i started listening to music which was after i met morgan and i listened to bands like paramore and green day and you know so on and so forth and I'm as a result, I'm very picky about my pop punk. And in that respect, it really boils down to the fact that Venus's voice is it it works. It's good. It's in many ways the prototypical pop punk singer voice. And it's just it's the same reason I can't really find myself enjoying a lot of Blink 182 and that it's just like, Oh, what's the fucking song where, uh, Spider Song, where (laughs) Spider, (laughs) it's just like, 
<laughs> Where it's are you? Back. Where are you? <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> it's just... It just, it hits my brain in like just, just the worst way possible. And that like, it has all of these merits of just like the, this, this sharp sardonic songwriting that I admittedly do have my thoughts on, but overall is very like, there's a lot of thought and there's a lot of attention to detail. And there's a lot of very complexly drawn characters and scenarios that result from uh Bemis as like a like an authorial voice and a lot of it just has to do with the fact that like this is definitely carried by great musicianship this is an album with great riffs and immaculate rhythm section like in terms of just the instrumental presence this is basically all you could ask for when it comes to a mid uh, 2000s pop punk album it, it's it's like it's genuinely ferocious um i would compare it i mean not just in instrumental like in how it's a little bit like simultaneously like heavier and more melodic is that give me a lot of pup vibes which is again an, a band that is like in this scene that like if i could describe my brand of you know pop punk music and stuff heavily skewed towards something like pup which again they have incredibly sardonic and biting lyrics and stuff uh like this album might uh and i guess it really just goes down to the fact that like on a song by song basis some of the sentiments here just even if i like identify with them i uh, here here's i feel like i've taken the role of august this week and that a lot of the youthful appeal of this album just just i find insufferable i i can't stand it um i th this is a song that i knew i was going to get bullied for my take on just because i saw morgan's rating of it but uh my least favorite song on here is actually the closer admit it and look this song goes really hard i <laughs> what do you have to say it. for yourself jake what do you have to I, say for yourself what I say for myself is this, and I knew this comparison would really piss Morgan off because I Total thought of it. Typical nonconformist. <laughs> See, okay, you 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 found it. Is that like here? Here it is. I'll just say it. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna retroactively give my podcast made a fucking aneurysm. This song's lyrics make me think of Rent, and there is nothing oh. on this earth you can do to piss me off more than making me think of red. And here's the thing, I get the kind of person that this song is lambasting. And in many respects, it's lambasting the kind of attitude that you find in Rent, uh, which I find so despicably deplorable and in, in, insufferable. But the deployment of lyrics and the attitude overall, I, I just, it, it's like, I get what he's saying, but the way he's saying it just I, I can't get over how much it makes me think of that. It's 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 just so so difficult. And admittedly, haha, this is the song where I find that the most difficult to get over. Um, there are occasionally moments where, like, on a song like "An Orgy of Critics," where I, I guess the best way to put it is that, like, no, I don't really get along with what the song is like doing, but like instrumentally, it's just pretty hard. So I can't really like. Like that, that song is just like blood pumping and exciting. So even if the fact that I find half of the verses here to be like, God, shut the fuck up, dude. I can't really find it in me to be genuinely annoyed with it. I like the song a lot. Um, there are moments, I, I think instrumentally, the only song on here that feels like, uh, well, I guess there's two songs that feel just a little bit stock and less inventive than the rest of it. That being probably uh, The Writhing South and uh, The Futile. Uh, the Writhing South is just kind of repetitive. Uh, the, the, the riffs in this are just, a, they're a little bit more stilted than the rest of the album. There's like a bigger emphasis, like I kind of like when the album goes for melody over rhythm. And these are admittedly two songs that don't really go for that. And then there are moments where conversely, the main presence here, Bemis, like, really leans into the fact that he's an unlikable asshat. Um, like, specifically on Every Man Has a Molly. Yeah, the most I, controversial yeah. song on this album. I was waiting to get to this one. I, I kind of love this song. 
Um, it's hot. It, I do well, too. It's because it's the most, it's the song that feels like it inhabits the least amount of gray area. It's just like, yeah, I don't think I'm supposed, like, again, I don't, like, again, it's snotty, bratty punk music. I know that I'm not supposed to like the character at the center of it and the concept of it goes into like, oh, he has to say all the things that are going in his head. But like, every man has a molly is just a guy being a sexist piece of shit. And it's really funny. Like, like really funny like the song knows that you are supposed to make fun of this man and it's 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 just hilarious the way it's written it's again it's written with that kind of wit but it's also like oh god what's the girl's last name it's molly molly connelly uh, connelly molly yeah. connelly that sort of the, the repetition of the name of molly connelly gets stuck in my head in the way that any good pop punk hook it's very uh, theatrical too and like yeah. the, ly- the lyrical passage of um the mean i think probably what i would imagine to be one of the most iconic lyrical passages on this whole album you goddamn kids had best be gracious yeah. with the merch money you spend because for you i won't ever have rough sex with money Co- M- molly Connolly again <laughs> see it's, it's just so flat on its face hilarious and there are other moments like that too, like um, on songs that I really care for, like Yellow Cat slash Red Cat, um, oh. which paints a really vivid portrait of yeah. the character at the center of this in a way that feels really well realized. Or on the best song on here, in my opinion, which is the opener belt, which yeah. is just, I mean, it goes really hard. And also like whenever there's like those really theatrical gang vocals on this album, I'm really into that. I really like how anthemic and cool all that shit is. Like that's well, 100%. Uh, awesome and there are moments of genuine vulnerability on here um i can't remember which song it's on but my favorite lyric on this whole album is just like because it really just hit me in the fucking relatable part of my brain which is um i feel skinny when i stand up but i'm buddha when i'm sitting i was i was gonna say that too i i i love that lyric and it's also just because yeah yeah yeah. and uh the second best song on the album my opinion which is the penultimate track, I Want to Know Your Plans, uh, which does feel like the most openly vulnerable song on here. And as such, it feels really raw in a way that the rest of the album, like, you know, sometimes it feels like it might be like putting up a front. Sometimes it feels sort of like honest, but in like a dickish kind of way. Whereas this just feels like revealing and and it it feels like it fully fleshes out the character. I just kind of wish it came sooner in the, the, the track list. And like, I overwhelmingly like a lot of the songs on here it's just that when you put it all together and you combine it with the fact that I don't love a lot of the vocal delivery and some of the personality is just a little too annoying it's just all of these very admittedly small bugbears piled on top of each other and this album is the epitome of an album that suffers from the death of a thousand cuts where I can call it good but I am really 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 glad that I don't have to listen to it again (laughs) and that sounds more insulting than it is but my point remains is that like I tried to get to the bottom of this and in doing so I really found out what I liked and what I didn't and at the end of it it's like yeah there's this has a lot of great things about it and I never I never I never want to listen to it again you know I was really interested and looking forward to and i am gratified by your thoughts on this album jake because like i was particularly interested to hear like your perspective on it as like a working artist as an author like because this is very much an album about like the author reckoning with like all of the pressures mm-hmm. and and reception and all these kinds of things about having to, wanting to be a certain way so that people will like you and all these sorts of things and wanting to like be transparent and and be like is seen in a certain light so that people like trust you and want to like you know get invested in what you're doing and it, and it is very like it's incredibly extra and it's like and it's localizing this within a niche as well that you freely admitted at the start you don't have like a lot of connection to in, in many ways it's easy to see this as a precedent for albums that would go on to become bigger and more acclaimed and this is kind of being left in the dirt because of how kind of unabashedly like just unafraid Bemis is to be like just kind of a real scumbag like oh the obvious reference point is and I respect that 
the obvious reference point is Weezer's Pinkerton, which I believe was also intended originally to be like this massive, like project. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know if it was intended to be like a musical. It was supposed but, to be called like Songs from the Black Hole. Yeah, or like it was like going to be this massive like theatrical project of some kind, I think, mm-hmm. or like a rock opera. And then it ended up being like pared down and made into something much more sort of like insular and minimal. But it shares a lot of similarities with that. Um, For me, I would say that if we're considering this record and Pinkerton to be within this kind of niche of emo that's incredibly kind of introspective and sort of meta and self-lacerating and ironic, I would say that this is an even more successful and exciting execution of that than Pinkerton, which is by far the more celebrated record. Again, like you wonder what that is, whether it's because Weezer went on to have such a commercially successful and widely discussed career. And the fact that it was obviously a follow-up to a, a massive album that already had a lot of attention. But this record for me satisfies so many itches I didn't know that I had. Uh, it's it, so yeah I was kind of being a little bit coy with Connor in terms of like my I was avoiding like rating it I was avoiding like speaking on it because I wanted to kind of like leave some suspense but I mean I, I you, you can't say you're that surprised either of you that I have yeah, no, loved because... this album and I think like as, we don't have to go into every track here but I found myself surprised by how many thoughts I had on just about every song how immediately they kind of embedded themselves into my brain and I came away from each song with an interesting thought or like that was really well written or interestingly written uh, for the most part. I think as Jake's already said, it kicks off masterfully with Belt, which is kind of like the epic sweeping operatic opener that you, that an album like this needs to have, right? It's, I mean, it's just unbelievably awesome. (laughs) Um, And the record begins with a song of rebellion. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and i love that little I, movie. I will admit that little part there already i was just like oh is this is what we're doing <laughs> <laughs> well it's probably for the best that all the spoken word and deludes that were supposedly planned got cut but i like that oh thank part. god <laughs> yeah i wouldn't i probably wouldn't give it a 10 that were, um, maybe i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but look the the one reference point i thought of while listening to this track and i i would say this is a band that have taken a lot from this album is Titus Andronicus and the Monitor in specific, Um, which absolutely like just in the refrains of things like they carted me off and and, um, this is something I have to do for myself and all the like ways that we took up our weapons, uh, like very Mm. Titus Andronicus to me, like and and just uh, Max Bemis has like a very Patrick Stickles energy. His voice is obviously different. Like Patrick Stickles' voice is more kind of gravelly and sort of uh, nasally and more traditionally punky. Whereas um, I, yeah, I guess I'm a little surprised that Jake doesn't like the voice here because the vocalist reminded me a little bit of the vocalist in uh, Wonder Years, which is a band that I know we all love. Um, but there is admittedly a kind of extra level of snottiness here that ex- will accentuate the album if you're on its level and will make it worse if you're not on its level. Um, so I think it's... 182-ification. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to not think of that now. So well done. But um, yeah, this is amazing. An amazing, amazing song. And I actually think that the record continues really strong with Woe as well, which feels equally yeah. like a kind of mission statement song for the record as well. Yeah, well you, start, good. you start to get these kinds of uh, musings on, again, the emo scene, the pop punk scene, the scene that Max is sort of evolving out of, but also is kind of not welcome within as well like this is very much a song about him kind of like saying fuck you to like the scene essentially and the ways that it kind of prescribes a particular kind of artistry and then denigrates and ostracizes you if you don't fit into a particular niche or look a certain way or act a certain way I like the little characters that he kind of paints and portrays like the girl in the song who um who's like I can't get laid in this town without these pointy fucking shoes like you get such a vivid picture there. <laughs> That's um, my favorite part. Yeah, it, it's super, super awesome. Um, and so you have these moments where it's like very sort of modern and very sort of meta. And then you have like, I'm stunned this hasn't been mentioned yet. I'm sure we were just kind of waiting to get to it. In my opinion, like the the, the masterpiece of this album, like the best song on this record. It's a little disconnected from like the other songs thematically and the meta aspect, but like, in terms of musicality and, and especially lyricism, alive with the glory of love, 
is a yeah. fucking powerhouse. I, I the first time I heard it, I was just like taking it in and I was like, wow, this kicks. And then I read what it was about and like, holy shit. It, learn, learning that this was essentially a song from the perspective of Max's grandparents who were Holocaust survivors and like their experience in, in a concentration camp and then like putting that context onto the lyrics um i, I totally misheard originally uh the Holy lyric red sector a batman i i totally uh, misheard the lyric air treblinka is alive with the glory of love the first time i heard the song I'm like what's he saying and then i read it, I'm like oh tr- yeah mm, that uh, and like i always when i first time i heard it i was like okay there's like it definitely like clear levels of metaphor that are going on here with like ghettos and work camps and stuff i just didn't and war and i just did not put two and two together that these were literally like this is literally a story of set in a concentration camp but of course because of the context of the record there are metaphorical layers to that that you can lay onto this but you know, I don't even really have an interest in doing that with this song because it's just a profoundly moving love song. When our city, vast and shitty, falls to the axis, they'll search the buildings, collect gold fillings, wallets and rings. But Miss Black Eyeliner, you'd look finer with each day in hiding beneath the wormwood. Love me so good. They won't hear us screw away the day. I'll make you say, I won't let them take you. I won't let them take you alive. Um, the the way this song opens up with like... A, a, I, an iconic opening verse, honestly, that's so powerful in the context of the story. When I watch you, I want to do you right where you're standing, right on the foyer on this dark day, right in plain view of the whole ghetto. Like the way that it starts out seemingly as this kind of like, you know, sex song. And then Max just reveals the setting of it. And it becomes like something completely different. It's really great storytelling. It's really great songwriting. I, I get a massive lump in my throat uh, in the third verse when he's like, should they catch us and dispatch us to those separate work camps? I'll dream about you. I will not doubt you with the passing of time. Should they kill me? Your love will fill me as warm as the bullets. I'll know my purpose. This war was worth this. I won't let you down. Fuck, man. Like, I, I, I had a little bit, of a, little, bit of a, a little bit of something in my eye when I was listening to that. Um, and then, like, it just shows you the, the different, like, layers that this album has, that it can be about so many different things. It can have such a theatrical flair about, like, you know, these really kind of, like, writerly concerns and, like, meta aspects of the suffering artist. And it can also have something like this in it, which is the kind of melodramatic song that only someone like that could write, um, which is why it fits. And, yeah, yeah it's just... Uh, <laughs> bravo i especially love the way the instrumental or the just the structure of the song too and this is this is a thing that i could say about nearly every song but like the way it starts out with almost like a it's like a barbershop quartet beginning where they're like ah and then and then he comes in with that it just strange opening line about wanting to do you right where you're standing but like you said when he reveals the setting it's like wow Oh, okay. But then the part in the middle where it goes back to kind of the beginning, like musically, and that that line you said earlier that our Treblinka is alive with the glory of love and plays like the main guitar melody, and then he just screams, "Okay, speed it up, go!" That's like one of my absolute favorite moments on this whole record, and and I just love how it's even though you're right, it like it's a song that can kind of like really hit home but it's just it's such a fantastic like expression of love that you just feel this rush while listening to it it doesn't feel like gloomy despite the setting it really sounds like it's you know everything that's horrible it's setting completely aside just focusing on the person you love and just that rush of excitement and yeah it's one of the most beautifully expressed songs on this album i think for sure and it's it, there's a reason why it's easily their biggest song ever um and like, also like just the the story of of these you know max's jewish grandparents and concentration camps like obviously alludes to max's jewish upbringing and this is something that's expanded on a little bit more in some of the bonus tracks that are included on the reissue like we don't have to get into them i explicitly said like don't feel you have to listen to them but i did check them out and there's one song in particular that i found really really funny 
and like some of these songs are like lean really really more strongly into the more sort of like you know despicable aspects of this character but there's one song called wow i can get sexual too uh which <laughs> which is um an absolutely hilarious song and it has like one of my favorite Legendary. lines it has one of my favorite lines that max wrote across all of these sessions which is um when she described her underwear i forgot all the rules my rabbi taught me in the old shul uh which is just so funny like you get across this record this sense of this angsty kind of like young kid who is like bottle it has bottled up and is dealing with all of these kind of like frenetic feelings like um another of the funniest lines on the album on admit it when he's like uh, i worry about how this album will sell because i believe it will determine the amount of sex i will have in the future <laughs> he just plainly <laughs> says that one he emphasizes and, sex so strongly. Yes. Yeah, he, he, he does. Like that, that's incredibly an incredibly funny moment to me. So that aspect of the record, again, it's not going to appeal to everyone. It will turn a lot of people off. It has turned a lot of people off. I think there's a reason why this only has a 3.55 on Radio Music compared to the 4.2 on Sputnik, which speaks to the different proclivities of the user bases of those websites and the sort of stuff that people that on Radio... being inclination to misogyny. Well, the, the particular like things that people on Radio Music are likely to clown. And again, it speaks to the fact. Oh, that yeah. Read, read some of the reviews. They are um, lacerating. And, and it's mm. and it, like it speaks to the fact that when this came out, like it was deeply uncool and it's had an uphill battle, even though it has been reclaimed to some extent. Um, and look, I will say as a person who loves this album, not every moment of it does work for me. I my least favorite thing here is Spider Song. Uh, I just think it's a it's a it does lean a little bit into the kind of you know whinier aspects of the delivery and the the repetitive nature of the hook is a little bit kind of grating in a way that it isn't on other parts of the record for me. Also, while I do like the spy, the obvious kind of spider metaphor and the way that he's kind of setting himself up as this kind of like ugly and predatory sort of sexual creature who is like unable to be romantic, I think is better that kind of portrait of him there is better expressed on other parts of the record. And I think is a little bit blunt here. Well, the whole record is pretty blunt, but like it's a little too blunt here in a way where some of the other literary stylings of the record are much more, I think, sophisticated and better conveyed. My other favorite song on this record comes into play here, that being Yellow Cat, Red Cat, uh, which again is a masterclass in songwriting. Like this yeah. is, you can tell that this is an English kid. Like, and I don't mean like English as in nationality. I mean, English as in like this kid excelled in English class because this song is incredibly literate. It has, um, it's, it's constructed like an English essay to a certain extent or like a piece of poetry that you would write. Uh, the way it tells these stories of these particular characters, both human and animal, and you get a metaphorical extrapolation that tells you a lot about the author, that tells you a lot about their perspective, you know, where he's telling these stories and then relating them back to himself at the end, by the end of the song. And he does it in a way that is, you know, it's pretty on the nose, but also at the same time, there is some nuance and there's some kind of beauty in it as well, especially in some of the verses in the song that get quite kind of abstract and pretty and, and, and sad. And yeah, I mean, this is also the song that has that line in it about I'm skinny when I'm standing, I'm Buddha when I sit, which I agree is a, as one of the many highlights of this song. I think that while um, that previous track before it, the uh, Alive with the Glory of Love is my favorite thing here. I think that the best showcase for Max as a songwriter is actually Yellow Cat slash Red Cat. I love how every single verse is kind of about a different character, but it's also like, musically different too where it, this whole song like kind of has this trotting beat to it with with just these like two chords that are playing over and over but then like towards the end they just get a more technical but still staying on that idea where instead of just the don't do 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 then it goes like boom do do but 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 boom do, and it's it's just like little details like that that really drive not only drive the music but drive what max is saying here which I think is goes to what you said that this is one of the best examples of songwriting on this record, and yeah. it, especially the 
I, I absolutely love the chorus on this song where it kind of goes into that like grimy bass break and then just soars into this like like loud Weezer guitar chorus that just stays in your head. There's one other track that hasn't been mentioned so far that really stuck out, st- stood out to me in terms of songwriting. And that's the song Chaya Like I Shall Grow, uh, which yeah. makes a uh, reference to Plato's allegory of the cave, uh, which is a core part of the songwriting of the song. Um, are, are you guys familiar with the allegory of the cave? Mm-hmm. Maybe. So it's like, it's, it's like the idea that um, people are living in a cave and they're only... Uh, their only contact with the outside world is like these shadows that are cast on their wall by like of the outside world by like a, a speck of light coming through a gap and because they don't know that the outside world exists the shadows are all that they have and so when like noises and things are happening outside they attribute them to the shadows and then like the idea is that if one of them were to leave the cave and experience the real world like it would be like it, it, it's the, the core of the the allegory is the idea that it is more satisfying to live in ignorance and that when you become aware of like how much you don't actually know and of how like you know difficult and real and strange and complicated the world is then you then that is the core root of suffering and like that's the point that Plato made with that story is that once you become aware that there is more to life than the shadows on the wall uh, then you know once you become cognizant of the fact that there are all these philosophical questions and answers and things that we don't know like that is the beginning of essentially like it's the beginning of the philosopher's journey but it's also the beginning of suffering is because confronting how much we don't know and so Max takes the core and he and he has elements of that allegory that are in a story like this and he applies it to this sort of social setting that he exists within he said on reddit that it's a song about emotional isolation and how that can produce apathy towards other people who have a life it is about existing in ignorance of the world around you and how that for Max, he, he can't live in total ignorance because he is cognizant of what he's missing out on. He is cognizant of the people that he doesn't belong to. He is cognizant of the world that has kind of discarded him and has kind of said, you know, to, you know, um, you know, cast him out of it. Like said, you won't, you can't be a part of us. And that's fostered a resentment in him. And that's made him this angry kind of like bitter and, and really sort of like unbearable human being. And he expresses all this by making reference to the allegory in the chorus, which is, again, one of the many great choruses on this record. Uh, I discard all feelings. The stars scar my ceiling. Sun, I won't spare you. Love that line. Moon, I won't spare you. Which, um, you know, again, it just speaks to the idea of being conscious of all of the things you can't be a part of, all the things you can't understand, and responding to that with, anger and responding to that with bitterness and responding to that by like just raging against all of it and i mean if you break this song down to its core it's kind of an ethos here that's at the core of a lot of pop punk and a lot of emo music right the unbelonging the fucking you know uh social isolation the uncoolness of like existing in this particular state and and being isolated and insular and stuff like that like the core ethos of this music that that max is is the scene that max is kind of existing both within and outside of is like absolutely refined to its core on the song and yeah it's there's like a double-edged sword to it as well because you could read it optimistically too with the ending of the song where he's kind of just repeating i'll grow and grow and grow like there's a you could apply a more optimistic reading of kind of overcoming the you know, bitterness, but ultimately it seems a little more sort of cynical than that. But there's a, you know, there's a complexity there um, that I like about it. It's, it's a really, it really stood out to me every time I listened to this record. I, I, I kind of think of that song in particular as like the dark horse of the album for me, because to me, it's like, it's easily a highlight so many times i've just replayed the intro of that song it's easily my favorite like intro of any song on here where 
it kind of starts with these bouncy clean guitars and then goes into these this chugging with the sliding synth lead and then that just takes you into that guitar lead where it's like doo -doo 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 -doo. and it's just such an immediate earworm it that's a, a song that pulls you in just immediately and yeah and i absolutely love the ending like you mentioned where he on kind of almost a positive note screaming the i shall grow and grow and yeah it's just a really cathartic moment and that's actually one one thing that i love about this record like is that they really know how to end a song i feel like on almost every track here there's like some sort of refrain that's not the chorus even that they just repeat over and over that just leaves you on with like you could just scream that you know when whenever you're listening to the record like um in my opinion one of the more underrated songs at least um from this discussion was is the feudal where at the very end in this like very pessimistic tone he's screaming uh i'm eating rat poison for dinner pull the cord from the phone i'm dining alone that's one of my favorite moments what do your hissy fits teach you except how to cry pussy cry like the way he sings that is so like just lacerating it's great. Do the old people teach us except how to die? Whatever. One thing, so one of the main reasons that I think this album works so well, at least for me, is that it's kind of simultaneously two things, which is one, it's like a satire on the whole emo and pop punk sound at the time. It, it satirizes that. I think actually one of the best examples going back to a track that we mentioned is Every Man Has a Molly which especially instrumentally almost feels like a direct Weezer parody, especially when that guitar solo comes in. Yeah. Like shit. that is so, that's so Weezer. That's just 100% Weezer right there. And just the huge power chords and the kind of more mid pace tempo of it all. It, it, this song, like at first it, for a while, it was my least favorite because I like by the end of it, I, I, I wasn't huge on like the, like when he repeats like i'll kill myself because it was like an over a little over dramatic but i feel like that was definitely done on purpose to like make fun of that of that niche that because at the time people i mean nowadays it's not really cool to make fun of emo at least i mean maybe you can be funny and make fun of it um but back in that day everyone was like or it was kind of funny to make fun of emo because of how popular it was at the time. So I think he kind of does that here, but I, I kind of went on a little bunny trail with that song. But my point is, is that the album functions both as a kind of satire on emo and pop punk while also being one of the most blatantly honest albums in emo and pop punk, which makes it even more emo than emo if that makes any sense whatsoever he mentioned once in an interview like like if these you know the bands at the time are going to write about their emotions and write about their personal why not just go all out and he says like why not mention that i haven't showered in a few days like just stuff like that yeah is, and, and think, now that kind of stuff like if you look at a lot of you know modern like what are we at like fourth fifth wave emo now then that sort of stuff is not uncommon. Like, like yeah. emo has shared a lot of its kind of like sort of literate poetics to be something that is about as sort of raw as it ever has been. And I mean, that era in which this album came out, like I remember growing up in that era and it was an era where like mental health issues were not taken seriously at all. Like it was an era where it was very commonplace and generally regarded as incredibly funny to like make light of like suicidality and like tell people to go and kill themselves and like make fun of people for being overwrought about their emotions or even being upfront about their emotions. Like at least where I grew up, like that was very normalized like that was just not yeah. you know something it, there's been an incredibly dramatic shift and in general societal and cultural attitudes towards mental illness and suicide in particular and it's interesting to see the ways that that cultural shift has affected like emo and, and the music that is rooted in those emotions and those experiences 
I, that's maybe a video essay in the making someday. I don't know. But I think that this is a sort of totemic record in terms of representing its era. And the fact that it has kind of fallen through the cracks somewhat, I think, is telling. Um, although I'd, actually, I'd be interested if any of our viewers have any thoughts on why this album isn't more beloved, uh, if there's anything that we haven't said or any, any perspectives that you have that you want to add to this. Because I think there's a lot of potential discussion for uh, whether this album maybe is due for a sharp reevaluation, whether this album will become like heralded as a classic of the genre, like in, in ways that many of its um, contemporaries have been. Yeah, it, I, I am surprised that I hadn't heard this until this week, that I think is, is the, the neatest way of encapsulating that. And it tells you a lot. Yeah, exactly. And this is an album that I feel like when people listen to it just on the surface, because a lot, you have to admit, like a lot of people, especially, you know, not specifically call it, but like rate your music, like a lot of people, you know, they just listen to it once and be done. And they're like, oh, the, you know, that was okay. You know, singer was annoying or whatever. And that's all they really do. But then like, when you kind of hear what he's doing, like there's, there's many moments on this record of like self-reflection that I think kind of get overlooked uh, among this whole bitter, cynical facade, pointing to what is actually my favorite track on the album, which is The Closer. This whole, like, spoken word rant in which he's making fun of the hipster subculture and this archetype, but he kind of is ironically doing it in a way in which they might speak using, you know, yeah. overly verbose language you know, saying pontificating to each other and just like over -pronoun pronouncing everything. But then like that, that last verse comes in, he's just directly says to you, well, I'm shamelessly self-involved. I spent hours in the mirror making my hair elegantly disheveled. He, he realizes that even though he's criticizing like so many different, you, you know, the scene, whether it's hipster subculture whether it's ex-girlfriends he kind of at the same time realizes that like he's just as flawed as everybody he's criticizing and he's really not better which i could see someone listening to this album and immediately using one of my least favorite words in music discussion which is pretentious but i could see why someone would say that about this record but i think there is that self-realization that i think is key to getting to understand what max bemis is going for on this record yeah and just like the moment in the song where he's just like i'm proud of my life and all the things that i've done I'm proud of myself and the loner i've become you're free to whine it won't get you far i do just find my car and my guitar like for all of the you know pontificating posturing and like you know representing those kinds of pretentious perspectives that's like an a, a delightfully kind of unfettered and just like real sentiment that's like not dressed up in any way at all. Like it's the most kind of unfiltered, just genuine thing on this whole record. And the song works because it builds to that, you know, to, to that expression and to, to him to be able to, you know, express in that way. Like, it's, again, it's very similar to how the monitor by Titus Andronicus ends with Battle of Hampton Roads. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and it has the same sort of sentiment and like, yeah, it's just... I'm a sucker for that kind of shit. Um, mm -hmm. And, and at the end of this record, like the way that that song builds and ends and just, it, it, yeah. it's blissful to me. I, I, I love that shit. That's what, that's that whole like ending is actually what makes it my favorite track because it wouldn't be otherwise. Yeah. But just when the instruments drop out and he's just singing and then they come back in and then he sings the very final line of the album where he says, he just screams at the top of his lungs when i'm dead i'll rest which is just a crazy way to end this record it's just and that's another thing is like max he does like have this voice he kind of sings in like this lower register a lot uh, to kind of emphasize that snotty like sarcastic tone that he's going for but it's the moments where he his voice is like where he's almost just screaming that I think are like a lot of the most powerful moments on the record, like the ending of the first song belt. And I think he purposely does that 
to really emphasize the just how much those sections and the end endings of these songs hit absolutely and i mean that last line that you referred to like when i'm dead i'll rest that's a fucking like emo as fuck lyric like it's a perfect yeah. way of ending a record like this right it's incredibly melodramatic um it's incredibly emo and i just have a fucking dumb goofy fucking smile on my face every time i hear it but yeah i think that's a pretty good place to wrap her up um shall yep. we do our favorite tracks and ratings then jake why don't you lead us off my favorite tracks are none of them. My least favorite tracks are all of them. One out of ten. Bleh. Okay. My my actual <laughs> favorite tracks are Belt, uh, I Want to Know Your Plans, and Yellow Cat slash Red Cat. My least favorite track is Admit It. Did anybody hear that screaming sound? Was that Morgan's voice or was that just me? Anyway, uh, six out of ten. Morgan did provide his favorite tracks and ratings as well, which I will read thusly. His favorite tracks are Alive with the Glory of Love, Yellow Cat, Red Cat, and Admit It. Uh, Morgan did not supply a least favorite track, and Morgan's rating is 9 out of 10. Uh, my three favorite tracks on this album are Belt, Alive with the Glory of Love, and um, Yellow Cat, Red Cat. Least favorite is Spider Song. And the album gets an 8.5 from me. Uh, and that leaves Connor. So my three favorite tracks. Um, well, my favorite track is actually a bonus track. It's called uh, Fuck You, Jake. Admit It is the best track. That's the name. <laughs> Th this album does have a lot of bonus <laughs> tracks. On, yeah. That's true. <laughs> no. But, yeah. Anyway, um, Admit It. Second favorite is actually uh, Chia Like I Shall Grow. And... I'll go with, uh, it's like a tie between Alive with the Glory of Love and Yellow Cat slash Red. I'll just say Alive with the Glory of Love. Least favorite track, if I had to pick one, would be, we didn't mention it, but Slowly Through a Vector. And mm -hmm. I give this a 10. Hell yes. That gives us an average of 8.4, which is nice. pretty, pretty good for a record like this, I think. Shout out to the bonus track titles, by the way, which I'm just looking at now. Um, <laughs> aside from, again, Wow, I Can Get Sexual too, which is the best one that I listen to. Uh, it's a Metaphor Fool is another great title. And just an all-timer title here. I will never write an obligatory song about being on the road and missing someone. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, I, I kill, 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 kill little girls. That oh, is yeah. One of them. Yeah. Little there it goes. That has some major Coheed and Cambria die white girls energy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let us know at home what you think of this album, what it means to you, if it's, if it's a significant record in your life, or if you hate it, why? Let us know in the comments below. We want to hear from you. We love getting comments, we love responding to comments, and um, we want to have a conversation about this really fascinating record. Why do you think it's so out of fashion? Do you think it'll come back into fashion? Let us know what you think. Do you have any other recommendations for records we should hear or emo staples that we should review? Let us know in the comments below. If you like the video, please consider hitting the like button. It's a really small thing, but it actually helps us out a, a heap. Uh, if you enjoy what we do, you can hit the subscribe button as well. We post three videos every week and we will be discussing more records like this, I'm sure, very, very soon. Um, if you want to go above and beyond and you really want to support us, you can hit the join button and for just $1 a month, you can gain access to particular perks such as having your name featured at the start of every video on this channel and priority comment response. And if you give us recommendations, your recommendations will go right to the top of the queue if you're a part of the Jam to family as well. So consider that again, obviously you don't have to, but um, the options are there. However, though, Thanks for watching. We really appreciate it. Thanks for sticking with us. As always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Gillette, the best a man can get.